ATTE Walker, in real world. How is it possible, and what will come of it? Today, we will analyze in detail the history and design of not only the legendary ATTE, but also other heavy walkers from Star Wars used by the Galactic Republic, and also find out how real such equipment is, and how will heavy walking vehicles look in the modern armies of the world. The description contains time codes for each walker. Nordy with you. And we are starting. ATTE, All Terrain Tactical Enforcer, the most famous representative of the ground equipment of the Clone Army, and along with the Elat gunship, it is one of the main symbols of the Grand Army of the Republic. Chronologically, ATE is the first walker of a new type, adopted for service, mass produced, and marked the beginning of a huge series of walking vehicles with the Index AT, All Terrain and other branches of walkers. It is important to understand that multi-legged walking combat vehicles have been in the galaxy before. For example, in the arsenal of various corporations and small state subjects of the Republic, including future separatists, for example, OG-9 homing spider walker, Octoptera Tridroid, and others. But they either used a very different design or were extremely low volume on a galactic scale. And it is the ATTE that is the progenitor of the branch of heavy walkers of the Galactic Republic, the Empire, and then the New Order. The ATTE Heavy Walker, which was a symbiosis of a powerful tank and a capacious armored personnel carrier, was one of the most popular ground combat vehicles in the Grand Army of the Republic. In the Star Wars universe, the ATTE Walker was produced in the hundreds of thousands each year and actively participated in various battles of the war, from small skirmishes to large-scale battles. Despite the ATTE's impressive military career, it is interesting to note that the tank was developed from transport vehicles designed to protect personnel in hazardous working conditions in mines and quarries. These civilian tanks were used by some mining companies in remote parts of the galaxy. Before the outbreak of the Clone Wars, the walker's design was adapted and a combat vehicle was developed from it. The Rotana Company, a division of the Quat Corporation, was responsible for the development of the future ATTE and its testing. Following the Sith Plan, the development and production of hundreds of thousands of tanks was kept under strict secrecy to avoid early discovery of the fact that the Republic was preparing an army capable of effectively resisting aggression from the future Confederacy of Independent Systems. The choice of Quat as the designer of the main battle tank for the Army of the Republic was successful. The company showed no sympathy for the Trade Federation and the Techno Union, the future driving forces of the Separatist movement. This circumstance created favorable conditions for maintaining confidential information. In addition, the cultural characteristics of the Ruthanians complicated the Trade Federation's attempts to conduct industrial espionage. Secret production lines for the new tanks were set up in underground factories and orbital shipyards, minimizing the likelihood of detection. The ATTE eventually made its debut at the First Battle of Geonosis, where it became a key element of the victory, easily defeating the poorly organized resistance of the Confederacy of Independent Systems Army on the desert plains around Stalgassen Hive, inflicting serious damage to both Separatist vehicles and infantry. The ATTE was a balanced system of two separate modules connected by a flexible adapter arm, similar to the concertina mechanism in some real-world trolleybuses. This device gave the tank outstanding maneuverability in confined spaces, for example in urban environments, and significantly increased its maneuverability, allowing it to overcome various obstacles such as ditches, trenches and faults. This design also provided additional advantages in traction, especially thanks to the special claw-like grips. The ATTE tank moved with the help of six relatively short legs, three on each side. These legs, although they limited the speed of the machine, brought greater stability and movement by moving the center of mass closer to the ground, especially when firing from the main gun, which had significant recoil. By the way, the maximum speed of the ATTE was 60 km per hour, which was enough in combined arms combat to accompany infantry. The tank's feet were equipped with magnetic grips, allowing the tank to navigate very difficult terrain, even vertical slopes, as demonstrated during the Battle of Tet. Thanks to the accordion and claw-shaped magnetic grips on the feet, the tank could climb steep cliffs, rising vertically. This unique capability has proven useful in various combat situations, especially in mountainous areas. Thanks to this, the ATT, equipped with heavy weapons, was a very effective military weapon, in conditions where the enemy could only rely on light small arms, mortars and grenade launchers. The tank's legs also provided it with the ability to easily overcome energy shields, which was not possible for vehicles on a repulsor chassis. Each leg was equipped with a group of sensors that constantly analyze the surface and automatically correct the tank's movements, preventing it from sinking into the ground. 
Based on information received from the sensors, the onboard computer made a decision about the possibility of using magnetic grips on a given surface. Despite the presence of six legs at once, if even one of them failed, the tank lost a lot of mobility and could completely lose speed. The propulsion system was located in an accordion surrounding the transition gateway between the two landing compartments. The vehicle's armament included six anti-personnel Mod 21 heavy laser cannon turrets. Four of them were located in the front of the tank, and two in the rear. These guns were intended to fight infantry, as well as lightly armored and unarmored vehicles. Each gun was installed in a separate ball mount with a large sector of fire, which made it possible to concentrate fire in the front hemisphere and effectively repel infantry attacks on the flanks. Thus, the enemy could be attacked by fire from at least three barrels, regardless of the direction of his movement. The main caliber of the ATTE was the Firefont 04 heavy artillery gun, with an effective range of 3 km using non-energy artillery shells. That is, it is a mass driver weapon. It was located in a kind of swinging tower, or rather, it was a carriage with a place for a shooter. The gun was reloaded by a belt-fed automatic loader. The belt with shells was laid along the back of the vehicle. Another tape was located in the bottom of the tank. The crew assembled the shells in the belt manually. The standard ammunition was 48 shells with different damaging parts. The gun, accurate and long-range, was designed to engage a variety of targets, including fortifications, infantry, enemy tanks, and armored vehicles. If necessary and with proper skill of the shooter, the gun can also be used to destroy air targets. The ammunition included a variety of shells, armor-piercing, sonic, anti-bunker, and adjustable shells. The latter were aimed at the thermal radiation of the target. The long effective firing range allowed the tank to support advancing troops from afar and conduct artillery preparation without being subject to enemy return fire. If necessary, instead of a mass driver cannon, the tank could be armed with a laser or blaster cannon. The use of a mass driver gun made it possible to launch projectiles along a hinged trajectory, hitting targets beyond line of sight. The flexibility of the vehicle, achieved by the concertina, made it possible to position the ATTE with its side facing the enemy, bend inward, and point all the barrels at once towards the attacking troops. Thus, the walker could perform well in a defensive battle, meeting the enemy with a barrage of fire from seven guns. The ATTE crew included seven, and in some models, eight clones. Driver controlled all movements of the machine using levers, pedals, and an onboard computer equipped with artificial intelligence. Spotter, who was also the tank commander, occupied a position behind the driver, slightly higher. Spotter, unlike driver, had its own surveillance device, including a periscope with a built-in rangefinder and night vision device. Some models provided additional space for an eighth crew member, who served as commander and was often an officer. He provided overall leadership and also acted as a unit commander, which reduced the workload on spotter. The driver and commander entered the tank through a hatch on the roof, or from inside the troop compartment, along with the rest of the crew and infantry. Four of the five shooters were located inside the tank, in the troop compartment. Their landing was carried out through landing hatches in the sides of the vehicle. The gunner operating the main gun took his position through the troop compartment, using steps and a double hatch on the roof of the tank. The ATTE tank could transport up to 20 fully armed soldiers in a seated position. On the walls of the troop compartment there were pyramids for the clone's personal small arms, DC-15A and DC-15S rifles. The Clone Wars campaign guide lists the number of troops as 38 soldiers. However, this figure seems implausible based on the overall dimensions of the walker and its layout. But, such capacity is also quite real. If the source was talking about full capacity, and not just about seating, in this case, from 38 to 40 soldiers could easily fit into the ATTE, but then the clones would ride inside the tank like real-world people in minibuses in the morning. While moving through relatively safe territory, marching in convoys of armored vehicles, clones love to travel on ATTE armor, comfortably sitting on the edges of the hull, like foot soldiers from real-world history. In particular, this method of transportation was popular with all sides in the Second World War. There was also a modification that included space for 10 soldiers in the front troop compartment and two folded ATRT reconnaissance walkers in the rear compartment with a lowerable lift ramp for disembarking the walkers. Based on the ATTE, there was also a modification of the command and staff vehicle, which housed a command and control center in one of the troop compartment. In addition to the landing force, on board the ATTE there was a socket for a medical droid model IM-6, located in the rear compartment. A similar droid was also standard on LAAT gunships. Loading and unloading of infantry was carried out through four side hatches. To do this, the walker crouched, and the infantry men could safely get out of the vehicle. This could also be done while moving, 
but jumping while moving from a 3 meter height can lead to injuries, and the clones tried not to take risks unnecessarily. The troop compartments were completely sealed and equipped with life support systems, which made it possible to be inside the tank without the use of helmets or other special equipment. Now it is important to pay attention to the key characteristic of any tank, armor. The ATTE's armor made it invulnerable to fire from both light and heavy small arms, whether handheld or stationary. The ATTE's side and rear armor could only be penetrated using powerful anti-tank grenade launchers, anti-tank guns and missiles. In particular, during the Battle of Ryloth, where Mace Windu's tank group came under attack on a narrow mountain pass, the ATTEs withstood numerous shots from the main caliber cannons of the AAT tanks without receiving a single damage. The tanks were stopped only after the droids were able to hit one of the front legs of the leading ATTE. The only means guaranteed to penetrate ATTE armor were the droid IG-227 missiles and the J-1 semi-autonomous proton cannon, one of the most powerful field weapons in the droid army. However, it is worth noting some shortcomings in the protection of the tank in the frontal projection. The transparisteel windows of the control compartment were easily penetrated by blaster cannons. Why the designers neglected to protect the crew in the frontal projection remains a mystery. After all, even in a maneuverable war that does not have a clearly defined front line and is spread out to great depths, which is exactly what ground battles were like in the Clone Wars, most of the shots most often fall on the tank in the frontal projection. In many battles, such as on the planet Teth, blaster bolts easily penetrated the driver's compartment, and despite their low power compared to anti-tank weapons, they caused the failure of several ATTEs. Note that even the cannons of the DSD-1 spider droids could cause serious damage to tanks, despite their lack of specialization in anti-tank battles. It is also worth mentioning the unsatisfactory protection of the main gun shooter, who for some reason was left without armor protection, becoming vulnerable even to light small arms fire. This vulnerability made him an attractive target for snipers. In the context of this problem, it is also interesting that the light gunners, being less valuable members of the crew, worked under armor protection. Finally, the weak side of the tank turned out to be its belly and legs. The ATTE's underside was thinly armored, although its strength remained unknown. Regarding the legs, they were deprived of armor, with the exception of the area where they were connected to the hull. The walker's armor also includes built-in electromagnetic shields that protected the tank from ion weapons. By the way, the main enemy of the ATTE, the AAT tank, did not have protection against electromagnetic weapons. To effectively transport tanks to the site of combat operations, and their prompt movement to strategically important areas, a cargo modification of the LAAT combat transport vessel was developed, about which there are several videos on the channel. The modification is specifically designed for transporting ATTE tanks and received the LAATC index. The presence of such transport personnel on the battlefield made it possible to land tanks already in the first wave of landings, bypassing the need to wait for the infantry to capture a sufficient bridgehead for landing large landing ships and disembarking the main troops. However, it should be noted that the LATC carrying the ATTE had limited maneuverability and was vulnerable to enemy anti-aircraft and fighter fire. As mentioned, ATTE tanks actively participated in many battles during the Clone Wars. It is interesting to note that sometimes these tanks were not used for their intended purpose. For example, during the Battle of the Bothawui Asteroid Field, Anakin Skywalker decided to surprise the Separatists by landing walkers directly on the asteroids. Six Munificent-class Separatist frigates, seeking to gain range to effectively attack three Venator-class Star Destroyers from Anakin's squadron, entered the asteroid field, Grievous. Expecting to encounter enemy fire along the course of movement, ordered all shield energy to be directed forward. Captain Rex, commanding a group of walkers, waited until the frigates were behind him, and then opened devastating fire on the stern of the frigates. Thanks to the coordinated actions of Rex's walkers and the fire of the Venators, all six of Grievous' frigates were destroyed, and he himself barely managed to avoid death by fleeing. Also noteworthy is the case of using ATTE to board a Separatist frigate, shown in the second episode of the second season of the animated series The Clone Wars. After the triumphant conclusion of The Clone Wars and the transformation of the Galactic Republic into the Galactic Empire, ATTE tanks remained part of the new military forces and were used against the remnants of the Confederacy of Independent Systems and certain worlds opposed to the Empire. In 19 years prior to the Battle of Yavin, Imperial forces under the command of Darth Vader began a campaign in the Atoa system. At the very beginning of the ground phase of the campaign, ATTE tanks, supported by infantry, successfully defeated detachments of local self-defense forces. However, several years after the end of the war, 
A significant number of ATTE tanks were withdrawn from service and decommissioned, and then donated or sold to loyal Imperial planetary governments. ATs were being replaced by newer models of walkers and repulsor tanks. As the ATTE fell into obscurity, many of the LAAT cargo transport ships were also withdrawn from active service as their value to the Stormtroopers Corps declined. The remaining, but in small numbers, ATTE tanks that remained in service with the Empire were sent to remote garrisons on the peripheral worlds of the Outer Rim. Even during the Galactic Civil War, many ATTEs continued to serve successfully. Some ATTEs were converted into cargo walkers. Mechanics removed the cannon, the upper armor of the troop compartment, and removed the passenger seats. Such modifications could be found on the planets of the Outer Rim and some worlds of the core, including, for example, the planet Callist 6. In the chaos of mass rearmament, some of the walkers fell into the hands of organized crime and anti-government illegal armed groups. Among these groups, the most famous ATTE owner was the Rebel Alliance. The rebels used walkers obtained as trophies, purchased on the black market, or found on the battlefields of the Clone Wars, carefully restoring them with the help of their mechanics. However, ATTEs were extremely rare in the arsenal of rebel troops, as the rebels tried to avoid large battles using heavy equipment. There is no evidence whether ATTEs were used in the internal conflicts that followed the death of the Emperor at the Battle of Endor. Most likely they were used. It is unlikely that local military leaders would not show interest in using outdated, but still powerful military vehicles to satisfy their political ambitions. SPHA, Self-Propelled Heavy Artillery, also known as the Mobile Assault Cannon, MAC. Chronologically, SPHA appeared simultaneously with ATTE and was developed as part of the first, then secret order of the Kaminoans. Developed by Rothana Heavy Engineering, the SPHA Walker was designed to fulfill the role of mobile ground-based long-range artillery support. It complements the two other key components of the Republic's military strategy, the ATTE Walker and the LAAT gunship. In a typical attack, the ATTEs and LATs would spearhead the assault, establishing a forward base and allowing heavier support forces, such as SPHA walkers, to consolidate gains and provide reinforcements. The main task of the SPHA on the battlefield was to remote provision of massive fire support for Allied forces, the destruction of enemy landing ships in the atmosphere to deprive the enemy of reinforcements, and the possibility of evacuation turning large advancing enemy forces into ashes and indirectly supporting allied forces in large-scale, combined arms battles, and also the destruction of impregnable fortified areas and the siege of cities. Here an analogy involuntarily emerges with the super-heavy artillery gun of the Third Reich, made in two copies and known under the names Dora and Schwere Gustav, and other similar Wunderwaffe, such as the lesser-known Colossal Cannon, again used by the Germans, but back in the First World War by the Kaiser's Germany, that is, SPHA was created to participate in large battles where ground forces need a powerful fire support capability. Simply put, you need a big gun. Based on these tasks, the design of the self-propelled gun began to hit various targets and perform more specialized missions. The SPHA had many modifications with different weapons, but the internal structure of the walker remained almost unchanged. Structurally, the SPHA was a huge armored modular carriage on a 12-legged walking chassis with a full-fledged ship-style reactor, a semblance of cabins for the crew, an analog of the captain's bridge, a powerful engine, and related systems that ensure the operation of the monstrous main caliber gun for which the walker was created. Although the most interesting part is the cannon for which the machine was created. First, we will take a detailed look at the structure of the walker itself. The basis of the walker was a solid fixed platform on 12 identical two-joint walking legs. Relative to the entire structure, the legs seem small, but in fact, they were not much smaller than the ATT's paws. Being approximately 5 meters in height, the legs were located 6 pieces per side along the arched bend of the body. Due to its appearance, the walker resembled an outlandish insect. Despite the huge mass and cyclopean dimensions of the walker, its legs allowed it to confidently overcome minor uneven terrain and evenly distributed the mass, preventing the self-propelled gun from falling into the ground. Thanks to the design of its legs and powerful propulsion system, SPHA was capable of reaching speeds of up to 35 kilometers per hour. One can imagine the horror that a giant one and a half hundred meters long and the height of an eight-story building could cause roaring through the desert at such a speed. However, the soulless droids did not succumb to panic attacks. Also impressive was the SPHA's maneuverability. The SPHA self-propelled gun could turn 90 degrees in just six to 10 seconds, which was an impressive performance for a vehicle of this size. And this was very important, 
since the size and weight of the main gun made it impossible to install it on a rotating turret, and even more so, to place it in the turret. For this reason, horizontal guidance could only be carried out by turning the entire body of the vehicle, and due to its mobility, the vehicle was able to quickly change targets. The engine that drove the support legs was located at the bottom of the machine. Its location is somewhat similar to the location of the propulsion system on the juggernaut, where the engine and associated systems also ran along the bottom. By the way, it is surprising that Republican engineers did not try to install a super heavy artillery gun on a super heavy wheeled tank, which was the juggernaut model Haw A6. The engine was as important as the reactor. After all, if it was disabled, the machine overnight turned into a huge motionless man-made hill of metal, capable of firing only in one direction along one line, and therefore did not pose any danger to the enemy. To ensure the operation of the self-propelled gun's turbolaser weapon, a significant amount of energy is required, which required the installation of a powerful reactor, similar to those used on light spaceships, corvettes and gunboats. This reactor occupied the entire back of the machine. However, due to its whimsicality and fragility, the designers surrounded the reactor compartment with massive armor, thereby increasing the size and weight of the combat vehicle. The exact characteristics of the reactor are unknown, but judging by the power of the shots, they are similar to the characteristics of ship reactors. In theory, in an emergency, the SPHA reactor could be used to power a small city by disconnecting it from the weapon. The main thing is to have enough fuel. There are no examples of such use. But it would be very interesting to see a settlement based around a damaged SPHA with a working reactor. The size of the self-propelled gun crew corresponded to its size. Ten gunners were assigned to operate the 12 rapid-fire anti-personnel blaster cannons used as defensive weapons. The other 15 clones were responsible for controlling the movement of the vehicle, monitoring the operation of the reactor, and operating the huge turbo laser, which is the main caliber of the SPHA. The entire process of controlling the machine is concentrated in a special control center, designed in the style of a ship's bridge. And this is logical, since the concentration of the entire crew in one room simplifies the coordination of actions and the work of the vehicle commander. In addition, the crew was supplemented by a unit of 20 to 30 soldiers responsible for protecting the self-propelled guns from attacks by enemy infantry. The infantrymen were in a separate room behind the bridge. It is not known for certain whether there were cabins or other rest areas for the crew inside the vehicle. Most likely, inside there was some kind of analog of a wardroom with beds and amenities, since sometimes the crew needed to remain in the walker for days while participating in intense battles. In this case, outside of combat, during movement, a pair of pilots and a deputy commander could control the walker, while the main crew rested, and in an emergency could be at the combat post in a matter of seconds. Supplies of food. Fuel and oxygen mixture were enough for one standard week. Considering that the SPHA operated as part of large units, and landed together with the acclimator cruisers, such autonomy was quite sufficient. SPHA had a serious drawback. Its high vulnerability made it incapable of quickly changing position after firing, and its bulky size made it virtually impossible to hide on the ground, making it susceptible to air attack. In addition, the SPHA lacked weapons to defend against enemy bombers and fighters. The ground enemy also posed a threat, as the blaster cannons and 30 clone troopers could not effectively protect her from attack by large units of infantry or armored vehicles. Particularly dangerous were the reactor that powered the gun and the engine that moved the support legs. If the damage was serious, the reactor could explode, which would lead to the instant death of the machine and cause significant destruction at a considerable distance from the epicenter of the explosion. One of the main disadvantages of the SPHA was its significant vulnerability. The low maximum speed prevented a rapid change of position after the end of the fire, and the dimensions of the vehicle made it almost impossible to conceal it on the ground, which made it susceptible to attacks from the air. In addition, the SPHA had no means of defense against enemy bombers and fighters. Twelve anti-personnel blasters were not suitable for the role of anti-aircraft systems. By the way, the Juggernaut had similar problems. One of the few Republic armored vehicles comparable in size to the SPHA. Its height without the tower was 15 meters, versus 20 meters for the walker. But unlike the wheeled Titan, which was vulnerable to attacks from ships from orbit, the SPHA itself could pose a threat even to heavy cruisers. The exact firing range of the turbo laser is unknown, but most likely it could easily reach ships at an altitude of 2 to 3 kilometers that entered the atmosphere to launch an orbital strike. It is unknown whether SPHAs were used as ground-based anti-space defense batteries. It is quite possible that turbolaser versions of self-propelled guns would show up in all their glory if used in this way. However, long distances of tens of kilometers greatly reduce the concentrated energy of the energy beam, which was dissipated in the air in dense layers of the atmosphere. 
but the ground enemy also posed a serious threat. The SPHA's blaster cannons and 30 clone troopers did not adequately protect the SPHA from a large infantry attack and were powerless against a massive attack by soldiers backed up by armored vehicles. Despite its fairly thick armor, the SPHA could not withstand fire from specialized anti-tank weapons for long. The biggest disadvantage of SPHA was its large vulnerability. Its clumsiness prevented it from quickly changing position after firing, and the SPHA's large size made it nearly impossible to camouflage on the ground, making it extremely vulnerable to air attack. By the way, the SPHA did not have weapons to defend against enemy bombers and fighters. A ground enemy could cause no less problems. Blaster cannons and 30 clone troopers could not adequately protect the SPHA even from a large squad of infantry and were completely powerless when attacked by a large squad of soldiers supported by armored vehicles. As already noted, the most vulnerable elements of the design were the reactor that powered the gun and the engine that drove the support legs. Particularly dangerous was the reactor, which, if seriously damaged, could explode, which led to the instant death of the machine, living within a radius of 200 meters, and also led to great destruction at a distance of 600 meters from the epicenter of the explosion. The general vulnerability of the vehicle forced an escort to be kept nearby. The self-propelled guns were ordered to be located in the rear of the formation of the Allied forces, under the cover of air defense systems, infantry detachments and armored vehicles. An unpleasant incident that clearly demonstrated the SPHA's vulnerability occurred during the Battle of Munalinst, when several self-propelled guns were destroyed by a homing spider droid OG-8 squad that broke through to them. Another drawback of the vehicle was the difficulty of transporting it to the battlefield. The vast majority of the Grand Army of the Republic's ground combat equipment could be delivered to the planet from orbit, using utility transport vessels such as the Elat Sea or via large landing barges. However, even large landing barges were unable to transport the SPHA. In theory, the SPHA could be transported on the external sling of several LAAT transport vehicles at once, focusing with strong cables. For example, how Boeing CH-47 Chinook helicopters transport light equipment in the real world. Or you can remember the movie Pacific Rim, where mechs were transported in a similar way. But in the case of SPHA, such transportation required at least a dozen LAATC, if not much more. Nevertheless, the idea is very interesting, although not a single similar case has been recorded. Therefore, the delivery of artillery walkers could only be carried out with the help of large landing ships, such as the Acclimator, to do this. The ship needed to land on the surface of the planet and lower special ramps. In one flight, the Acclimator could transport 36 SPHA, along with other equipment and troops. By the way, Juggernaut had a similar problem. Yes, they had a lot in common between a wheeled armored personnel carrier and a walking self-propelled gun. It is not difficult to guess that this method of landing became impossible during fast and unexpected operations, and, moreover, it was difficult to hide from enemy reconnaissance actions. Problems with transportation did not allow the rapid transfer of self-propelled artillery units to key areas of defense or offensive. If the enemy had even small air defenses, the SPHA had to be landed at a great distance from the target, after which the vehicle had to independently get to the site of the future battle. If it was supposed to fight in mountainous or wooded areas, the SPHA's combat effectiveness was reduced to almost zero, only if the command does not decide to demolish the mountains with turbo laser fire. By the way, an interesting idea. In theory, the explosion of a mountain and scattering rock fragments over hundreds of meters could cause serious harm to the enemy. The main thing is that the mountain range is not a nature reserve, otherwise the local government will be very unhappy. In a wooded area, again in theory, SPHA could simply burn out the forest with a couple of shots. This is what an engineering machine looks like. As you can see, the huge size of the vehicle was to blame, but that was the price to pay for powerful weapons, which we'll talk about now. But don't consider SPHA useless. The appearance of just a few of these self-propelled guns on the battlefield was guaranteed to have a great influence on the outcome of the entire battle. The original version of the SPHA was the SPHA-T, armed with a massive turbo laser whose power was unmatched by many large warships of the era. It was the installation of such a powerful and massive weapon that determined the dimensions and layout of the walker described above. After all, first of all, it was the turbo laser that consumed the largest amount of energy for which a ship-class reactor was installed. The SPHAT was the main type of self-propelled artillery used by the Grand Army of the Republic. This vehicle was armed with a powerful turbo laser cannon, designed to destroy heavily fortified ground targets and strike slow-moving air targets, such as C-9979 landing shuttles. Even one such SPHAT installation was capable of disrupting an enemy landing and inflicting significant losses during the landing. 
It was this turbolacer weapon, thanks to the high firing range of the main caliber gun, that could strike ships located in low orbits and in the upper atmosphere, preventing them from providing direct fire support to their troops. It was the SPHAT battery, on Yoda's orders, that opened fire on the Trade Federation's Lucre Hulk class core ship, which was attempting to escape into space from the surface of Geonosis. Slowly rising ships became ideal targets, and experienced clone gunners became accurate marksmen. As a result, not a single beam missed its target, and the Separatists lost 14 ships. However, the SPHAT not only coped admirably with the role of a super-heavy anti-aircraft gun, thanks to the features of the turbo-laser weapon, it effectively destroyed fortifications, defensive walls of cities, defense centers and concentrations of enemy equipment and infantry. In battle, the SPHAT was to be positioned behind the battle line and cover it with fire from long distances. However, reality often made its own adjustments. For example, in the same battle on Geonosis, due to the dynamic and fast nature of the battle, self-propelled artillery units found themselves at the epicenter of the battle, where they also performed quite well. In the final years of the war, another unusual use for SPHAT was discovered. At some point, Anakin Skywalker suggested firing a self-propelled artillery mount directly from the ship's hangar at enemy starships. This unconventional approach found its supporters among naval officers and was used from time to time in space battles. For example, in the Battle of Coruscant, the captain of one of the Venator Star Destroyers used this tactic. With a single accurate SPHAT shot, fired at very close range, it destroyed a munificent class frigate, breaking it into two parts, and generously scattering its debris throughout the orbit of the capital planet of the Republic. At the same time, the turbolaser easily penetrated the remaining shield and destroyed the ship in the bridge area. By the way, it's scary to imagine how much money and effort went into clearing the orbit from thousands of tons of scrap metal that was once powerful fleets. As noted earlier, the Grand Army of the Republic included not only variants of self-propelled guns with turbolaser weapons, thanks to their modular design, self-propelled artillery mounts could be adapted to various combat missions. However, the exact time required to replace the main gun remains unknown. This process probably took from several hours to several days, depending on the complexity of the technical aspects and the equipment of the personnel. The following modifications of the SPHA self-propelled guns are known. Self-propelled guns with ion cannons were designated SPHAI. Unlike turbolasers, the destructive power of the ion cannon was lower, but even a single successful hit could cut off power to an enemy ship or disable a large group of droid infantry, making this modification significant on the battlefield. For reference, Ion weapons in Star Wars knock out electronic systems, including droids, when they hit a target. The self-propelled gun with the designation SPHA Fee differed from other modifications in that, instead of a turbo laser, it was equipped with a high-power laser. It was specially designed to effectively combat armored vehicles on the battlefield. The SPHA C was a modification of the self-propelled artillery unit, where the traditional cannon was replaced by a missile launcher. Possessing an ammunition capacity of 48 missiles with a high explosive warhead, these missiles had significant power, capable of turning even large ships into scrap metal. Unlike a turbo laser, missiles could create a wide field of fragments, which made them an effective means of destroying the enemy over large areas. However, limited ammunition required constant supply and the availability of transport vehicles for charging missiles. Due to the use of energy weapons, the requirements for the reactor were reduced and energy costs were reduced. Thus. This variant of the Walker was a heavy MLRS. The SPHAM is an alternative version of the self-propelled artillery system, designed to address the limitations of beam weapons, which are unable to be fired and do not produce a cloud of fragments when hitting the target. Instead of a turbo laser, this variant is equipped with a massive artillery cannon that fires regular metal projectiles. Although the penetrating power of such projectiles is lower than that of a turbo laser, their explosions pose a huge danger to enemy infantry. All of the SPHA modifications mentioned above were actively used throughout the Clone Wars and were subsequently inherited by the Galactic Empire. However, their fate after the end of the war remains a mystery. It is likely that most of these self-propelled guns were disabled or redistributed to distant regions of the galaxy. This assumption is facilitated by the emergence and adoption of a lighter version of the SPHA, called SPMA, Self-Propelled Medium Artillery. ATAP, All-Terrain Attack Pod also known as Pod Attack Walker, ATAP Self-Propelled Artillery Walker, Sniper Tank. While the ATTE was a hybrid tank and heavy armored personnel carrier whose primary purpose was to transport and support infantry,
the ATAP specialized in destroying enemy heavy armor and fortified areas whose armor could withstand hits from smaller calibers. Thus, the ATAP Walker is actually an anti-tank self-propelled gun. It was based on this role that the design and characteristics of the Walker were determined. ATAP began to be developed at the beginning of the Clone Wars, when battle experience showed the need for the presence of such equipment in the troops. The SPHA was not suitable for direct support of regimental level units on the battlefield due to its enormous size and power. Therefore, as an emergency, Quad and Rattana engineers began to create a new machine. Since the development, unlike the ITT, no longer required secrecy, and Rotana heavy engineering as part of Quad Drive Yards openly sided with the Galactic Republic, the new vehicle was developed in the shortest possible time. And already in the second half of the Clone Wars, ATAP took an active part, fighting in key areas. In particular, ATAP largely ensured victory in the battles on Kashyyyk and Felucia in the final stage of the Clone Wars. But if in the homeland of the Wookiees, the main striking power of the Grand Army of the Republic were juggernauts, then in the bizarre terrain of Felucia, consisting of forests of various plants and mushrooms, wheeled titans could not be delivered. Which is why the main burden fell on the ATAP, which with its excellent running and firing characteristics, made the main contribution to the victory. So, it's time to take a closer look at the design of this very interesting representative of the walking fleet of armored vehicles of the Republic. ATAP's main caliber was a very powerful mass driver weapon with an effective firing range of 5 km, capable of destroying long-term enemy fortifications, breaking through gaps in them, and destroying concentrations of troops, effectively supporting advancing infantry and equipment, thanks to various fillings of ammunition. From cumulative and armor-piercing, literally demolishing buildings and piercing through enemy equipment, to high explosive fragmentation shells designed to destroy enemy manpower. And in the case of the CIS, droid power. The shells, filled with hundreds of destructive elements, were excellent at mowing down not only living infantry, but also mechanical soldiers. Firing heavy projectiles with enormous destructive power, the mass driver's ammunition capacity was 50 shells of various types. There was a serious reason for installing a seemingly archaic mass drive weapon as the main caliber. After all, in order to install a powerful blaster cannon on a walker, it was necessary to somehow place in it a generator of appropriate power with accompanying systems for energy distribution, cooling, and other things, which, in turn, entailed an increase in the size of the entire self-propelled gun. And the larger the machine, the easier it is to get into it and the less cross-country ability it has. The use of non-energy projectiles, not laser or plasma, made it possible to make the self-propelled gun quite compact, but at the same time possessing a very powerful weapon. In addition, the ATAP developers took the trouble to install fairly advanced fire control systems on the self-propelled guns, which turned the self-propelled gun into a kind of sniper among tanks. Also, the use of mass driver shells made it possible to fire along a hinge trajectory, similar to the ATTE cannon, which was very useful when shelling cities, fortresses, shooting from behind cover, or at the enemy in trenches, and on very hilly terrain. But plasma and laser projectiles, due to their orders of magnitude smaller mass, were not subject to the ballistic effect to a sufficient extent. Paradoxically, the main disadvantage of this weapon was its power. Due to its large size, the cannon could not be installed in the rotating turret, so it was tightly fixed in the body of the walker. Apparently, the gun did not even have vertical aiming angles. Therefore, the gun was aimed by turning the hull. However, this was not a big disadvantage, considering that due to the recoil of the gun when firing, the ATAP still required a complete stop and extension of the third leg. By the way, it was the legs that carried out the vertical guidance of the gun. Shooting while moving was impossible due to the almost guaranteed overturning of the walker due to recoil. Even in a static position, without extending its third leg, the walker risked being thrown back by the energy of the mass driver's shot. But this does not mean that the ATAP was defenseless on the move. The second caliber of the walker was the Firefont 04 heavy artillery gun. And this is not just the same model of gun as on the ATTE. It is an absolutely identical combat module. If you swap these guns with ATTE and ATAP, you won't be able to notice the difference. The main difference was only in the placement of the ammunition belt, as well as its type. The ATAP's fire font relied heavily on energy plasma projectiles. They were easier to fire on the move and better suited to destroying armored vehicles in open combat. In addition, this reduced the recoil, which, when using mass driver projectiles, albeit to a lesser extent, still created the risk of the walker overturning when moving. When firing plasma, this risk disappeared. The gun modules were completely replaceable, if necessary. In the field, it was possible to remove the gun from a damaged walker, 
and place it on a vehicle that was moving, but lacked a gun due to damage. The characteristics of the gun were identical to the ATTE, as was the problem of exposure to the turret operator. It is unknown whether there is a hatch on the roof of the ATAP hull for the gunner, or if he had to climb up to the turret along the sides of the hull. Most likely there was such a hatch, otherwise the gunner's position would have been very unenviable. The self-propelled gun arsenal was completed by a light, rapid-firing pulse laser cannon, with an effective firing range of 1 km, located under the cockpit, ideal for combating enemy infantry. The location provided a wide range of fire, minimizing the dead zones through which enemy infantry could get close to the walker's feet. The ATAP's crew consisted of only three people, a pilot and two gunners, one of whom was the crew commander and they were clearly not enough for optimal control of the vehicle. The laser cannon installed in the front of the vehicle, under the control compartment, was controlled by the walker pilot. Controlling the machine did not require much effort and attention, thanks to developed automation systems, which included an onboard computer with specialized AI, sensors and motion detectors, and more. This allowed the driver to easily be distracted for a moment in order to send some impudent droid with a grenade launcher that unexpectedly appeared along the route to mechanical paradise to destroy concentrations of infantry and small targets that do not directly pose a threat to the walker. The pilot, as a rule, was not distracted, because there was a risk of overplaying and losing control of the movement of the machine, which is fraught with unpleasant consequences. To destroy such targets, also enemy armored vehicles. A roof-mounted cannon was mainly used. Like the six-legged tank, this gun was controlled by a separate crew member. The gunner of the main caliber gun was the commander of the ATAP, and this was the disadvantage of the vehicle. After all, the commander had to aim the gun, fire, search for and select targets, coordinate fire with other self-propelled guns, and at the same time also control the actions of the shooter and driver. By the way, there were similar problems in the AAT tanks of the Separatists, except that it was much easier for droids connected by a common team to interact than clones. The most logical solution would have been to add an additional soldier to the crew, but this was not done. It's very funny that at the same time, ATTE had a total of 7 crew members for 7 turrets, and in later models even 8. At the same time, no one was going to introduce an additional full-time crew member into the ATAP. The crews could only rely on their own skills and abilities, and on a fairly developed automation system. The exact internal organization of ATAP is unknown. Presumably, the pilot's position was located to the right of the gun, behind this viewing slot in the massive protrusion of the hull. The commander either sat behind the pilot or was located to the left of the gun, next to the hatch. By the way, this hatch is the only reliably known entrance to the machine. Most likely there were other hatches, including one for the gunner at the top, but they are unknown. Several more hatches to simplify access to the engine room were located in the bottom of the walker. It is not known exactly how the crew climbed aboard the vehicle, probably with the help of ladders, like on the light walkers from the last video, or if the ATAP could crouch, the crew would be able to independently climb up and down from the walker. There are no handrails, brackets or other elements that simplify access to the machine on the ATAP body. The machine was driven by a propulsion system, which occupied the entire rear part of the walker, accelerates the walker to a maximum speed of 60 km per hour. No matter how powerful the engine was, greater speed could not be achieved due to the specific nature of the ATAP walking chassis. This, by the way, is the main problem that limits the speed of all walkers in general, and not only in Star Wars, but this will be discussed in detail in the chapter on realism. To move, the vehicle used two legs, while the third support leg rose to the body during movement and was securely fixed there, and was used mainly when firing from the main gun. To fire a cannon, the ATAP lowered its support, thereby giving itself a more stable position. Sometimes the support leg could be used when moving the walker through difficult terrain where two legs were not enough. Nevertheless, the walker's cross-country ability was at a fairly high level, given the dimensions and class of the vehicle. Remember the same battle on Kashyyyk, where ATAPs walked briskly in the battle formations of the 41st Elite Corps and the 501st Legion along the uneven coast. The disadvantages of self-propelled guns include its high vulnerability, ATAP had very weak armor, and also did not have shields. The high visibility of self-propelled guns on the battlefield did not contribute to survivability which was an unpleasant consequence of its size. Speaking of sizes, the total height of the ATAP was 10 meters 97 centimeters. On the one hand, this increased the visibility of the vehicle on the battlefield, which increased the risk of destruction. On the other hand, an 11 meter self-propelled gun could easily fire through hills, trees, low houses, and other natural and man-made features of the area. The length of the ATAP, taking into account the main caliber mass driver gun, was 15.24 meters. 
In some cases, this limited mobility, since the weapon clung to the walls of buildings, tree trunks, and so on. But thanks to its location, the gun barrel quite often ended up higher than the obstacles. The width of the walker is estimated at approximately 8 to 9 meters. Although ATAP appeared in the army towards the end of the Clone Wars, they still managed to take part in most of the most important battles of the last phase of the war. After the end of the Clone Wars, the ATAP continued to be used by the Galactic Empire. A number of these self-propelled guns ended up on the black market, from where they fell into the hands of large gangs of pirates and mercenaries. Most likely, ATAPs fell into the hands of criminals through bribery of officials, were captured from planetary garrisons of local governments, or were found on the battlefield and restored. In addition to some gangs, ATAPs could be found in the private armies of the Hutt Cartel and the Zan Consortium Army. Of course, as with many other technologies from the Clone Wars legacy, a certain number of walkers fell into the tenacious hands of the Rebel Alliance. It is known that the Rebels modernized the obtained machines. Many ATAPs were equipped with an additional mass driver cannon, which increased the firepower of an already powerful walker. The guns were probably fired alternately. Otherwise, it's scary to imagine where the walker would have flown due to the recoil from two simultaneous shots. By the way, in some ways this modification is very reminiscent of the original double-barreled version of the Russian self-propelled gun coalition SV. Almost nothing more is known about the post-war fate of the ATAP. Probably, they, like the other legacy of the clone army, were actively exploited by the New Republic and the remnants of the Empire during the Galactic Civil War, especially several decades after Yavin, when the Imperials suddenly began to question the construction of new military equipment. Then they used something that could drive, fly and shoot. Summarizing all of the above, we can conclude that Rotana's engineers managed to create a very successful self-propelled artillery unit, capable of effectively supporting troops with fire at a short distance from enemy positions. ATOT, All-Terrain Open Transport, was a transport and cargo walker designed to conduct transport operations in close proximity to the front line. It is the last walker developed and used by the Grand Army of the Republic during the final years of the Clone Wars. After it there was the ATAT, -AT, which by the way managed to undergo combat tests while still in the Republican Army. But nevertheless, the four-legged giant was finally finalized and adopted for service already during the years of the Galactic Empire, so it should not be classified as a Republican walker. Therefore, the last heavy walker of the Republic in chronological order was the ATOT. To meet the requirements for maneuverability and efficiency in transportation, Quat has developed the ATOT, a transport version of the walker, that is not inferior to military models in terms of performance. To facilitate the process of loading and unloading, the design of the vehicle is devoid of a roof, which allows it to transport cargo and passengers in an open area. Despite the fact that the ATOT has armor and weapons, its use as a combat platform is not recommended both for the vehicle itself and for the cargo and passengers it carries. The ATOT was different from other Quats walkers because it was not designed for combat, but was used as a cargo and transport vehicle. Thus, the walker should not be blamed for weak armor, given its original purpose. The walker's chassis consisted of eight identical legs, providing the vehicle with high maneuverability and good load-carrying capacity, which was critical for a transport and cargo vehicle. Despite its impressive size, the walker was smaller than the ATTE, measuring 14 meters in length. In infantry form, the ATOP was equipped with 34 seats for infantrymen. In total, much more could fit into the walker. If you don't take into account comfort, there are up to about a hundred clones in full garb. These seats could be removed and cargo loaded in their place. The exact carrying capacity is unknown, but it was unlikely to be less than 10 tons. The walker's crew consisted of one pilot. He controlled the movement of the vehicle and also supervised the firing of the two front guns. In total, the walker was armed with two forward-facing medium laser cannons and two stern cannons of the Mod 21 heavy laser cannon turrets model. Like on the ATTE, the stern guns were controlled by gunners from among the landing party. Of course, these weapons were rather meager, but they were enough to protect the walker from minor threats. After all, as stated, the ATOP was not originally intended for direct participation in open battles. In addition, the firepower was significantly enhanced by the transported troops. Even a squad of nine clones, covered by the armored sides of the walker, and being at a decent elevation, could give a worthy rebuff, especially with the grenade launchers and heavy blasters often carried in the back of the ATOT. The maximum speed is 55 kilometers per hour. Depending on the mass of the cargo, the speed could decrease. Even with eight-wheel suspension, good armor and four defensive laser cannons, these vehicles were very vulnerable due to the open top. 
The main task of the all-terrain vehicle is to deliver soldiers and cargo. On the battlefield, the ATOT was carried by a cargo LATC. The sealed docking part of the ship served as a roof for the vehicle during transportation. Despite its disadvantages, the ATOT turned out to be a very successful transport and continued to be used during the time of the Galactic Empire. Imperial forces in remote garrisons very often used such vehicles, capable of carrying heavy loads, and at the same time adapted for operation in combat conditions. Thus, the Republic walkers complemented each other perfectly. ATOT transported soldiers and supplies to the battlefield. ATAP specialized in destroying enemy armored vehicles, and ATTE delivered and supported soldiers on the battlefield, acting as a strike force, while SPHA provided orbital protection and the elimination of large targets. But it is worth understanding that to achieve the best results, walkers must be used in close cooperation with other branches of the military and equipment models, repulsor tanks and speeders, wheeled and tracked vehicles, gunships and aircraft. It is in effective command and coordinated work of all branches of the military that the path to victory lies, both in Star Wars and in the real world, and in other fictional universes. Now let's see how real the Republic walkers are and what niche can they have in the armies of the real world. We will analyze in detail the realism of the ATTE design, and then consider the concept of using each walker. Interestingly, the ATTE is a fairly realistic tank from a design point of view. Naturally, as with other Star Wars vehicles, the most unrealistic thing is the weaponry of the vehicle. But this only applies to six auxiliary laser or blaster cannons, while the main caliber mass driver weapon is quite realistic from an engineering point of view, since at its core the mass driver weapon is a railgun which, although very complex for modern technologies, is quite a real type of weapon. As for the walker chassis, from a physics point of view, it is a completely realistic system. The total support area of six limbs will allow the tank not to sink into the ground while moving. Hello to elephants and dinosaurs from the real world. The insectoid configuration of the ATTE legs allows you to evenly distribute pressure on the ground and maintain balance when walking and shooting. Modern programming technologies will make it possible to easily create software or even full-fledged artificial intelligence responsible for the movement of a walking tank. Scanners and sensors on the legs of a tank would resemble those on modern unmanned vehicles, drones, robotic vacuum cleaners, and other automated modes of transport. Advanced military AI would make it possible to easily analyze the soil for the possibility of movement on it. In Star Wars, the ATTE's legs are quite a weak point in terms of armor. In reality, it would not be difficult to strengthen them with additional armor. Also, a real walker will have a full-fledged turret with a main caliber gun, with full protection for the shooter. Or the tower can be made unmanned. It is also possible to install a swinging tower on the walker, which is shown on the ATTE in Star Wars. In a swinging turret, the barrel and the turret are motionless relative to each other, and vertical guidance is achieved by lifting the turret itself. In the real world, such a design was abandoned. So an earthly walker will most likely have an ordinary tank turret. The design of the tank's cabin will also be changed. Most likely, it will be brought deep into the body under the protection of armor and will be deprived of any transparent elements in favor of external surveillance cameras. All these changes will help to significantly increase the survivability of the tank in combat conditions. Instead of six laser and blaster cannons, you can install anti-personnel machine guns and small caliber autocannons and missile launchers. The use of AI will reduce the number of shooters in the crew. In addition to all this, the design of the walker can be radically revised and modified in the manner of a walking excavator, by adding lifting wheels and changing the design of the leg mechanism. This will allow the tank to have the advantages of both wheeled and walking vehicles, which will radically affect the cross-country ability, range of applications and combat effectiveness of the vehicle, the ability to carry a significant detachment of infantry in the troop compartment or transport cargo also gives the Earth 8TE significant advantages over other equipment. Now let's look at the concept of using Earthly ATTE. Despite good armor and weapons, the walker is unlikely to be on the front line and take part in head-on collisions, since despite the improved armor, the legs of the walker still remain the most vulnerable part of the vehicle. It can be assumed that such a technique will best prove itself as a self-propelled artillery unit, which is facilitated by a main caliber gun. The ATTE will quickly reach a firing position using its wheels, and will then transform into a gun position by retracting the wheels and exposing walking supports to securely fixing the vehicle during shooting. Troops transported inside the walker and numerous machine guns on the hull will allow the tank to act independently, providing itself with protection from transported infantry and close defense points. It is also possible to install surface-to-air missiles on the vehicle to enhance air defense. 
the tank's chassis will allow it to occupy the most unexpected positions in gorges, canyons, mountain ranges and other difficult to reach terrain. This will also allow the vehicle to be used as an all-terrain vehicle for fighting in mountainous areas where conventional equipment simply cannot go. A gun capable of firing along a mounted trajectory like a mortar will be very useful in areas with mountainous terrain. The presence of such a tank will greatly increase the chances of victory and may even change the course of the entire battle. In addition to purely military use, the terrestrial ATTE can also be used for civilian purposes. As an all-terrain research complex, there is enough space inside to accommodate equipment and residential modules. Also, such a machine can be used as a loader and a walking excavator. Thus, for a modified earthly ATTE, there can be a lot of different tasks. But despite the obvious usefulness and theoretical possibility, the practical implementation of a walking multi-ton combat vehicle is a very difficult design task. A six-legged walking chassis is a very complex mechanism on the scale of a tank, which requires constant, expensive technical support. Also, to propel such a tank, a very powerful engine will be required, requiring an extremely large amount of energy, thus making ATTE a reality. Although real, is a very complex and expensive project, which does not justify itself in the presence of helicopters capable of performing combat and civilian missions in mountainous areas where ground vehicles have no access. What about other walkers? Everything here is much more depressing than with a six-legged tank. The ATAP seems unrealistic for the same reasons as the ATDT walker from the video about light walkers. Even with three supports, the recoil and center of gravity will overturn the walker when firing from the main gun, or the self-propelled gun will get stuck in the ground. In general, the design is meaningless. Now SPHA. Firstly, the main advantage of this machine in Star Wars is the turbo laser cannon. In reality, Modern technologies do not allow the creation of such weapons. But even if they had allowed it, there simply would have been no targets for such a superweapon. Fortunately, we have no need for anti-orbital defense, except perhaps to shoot down meteorites. In a ground battle, a titanic self-propelled gun will be meaningless. A walker the size of a naval destroyer will immediately be subjected to massive artillery and aviation fire, and no air defense systems or thick armor will save the vehicle, and the financial losses from its loss will be catastrophic. Moreover, how will such weapons be used? Shooting with a turbo laser is only possible at direct fire, without mounted fire. That is, fire will have to be conducted within line of sight. Firstly, this greatly increases the risk of losing an already vulnerable machine, and also creates problems with transportation. It's scary to imagine the effort it will take to move such a machine. It can only be transported on aircraft carriers, where SPHA will be loaded with dozens of cargo helicopters. Rail movement, like those of the mentioned German superguns, will be extremely vulnerable. And again the question, what targets will the fire be fired at? In fact, there is one interesting idea for using this machine as a means of anti-ship naval defense. A huge laser cannon will directly destroy enemy landing ships. But here again is the problem of vulnerability. And this has not yet described the problems of walking a walker. With such a huge mass, 12 relatively small legs are not enough to distribute the pressure on the ground acceptable. How it is calculated is described in the video about light walkers. The SPHA's legs will simply collapse and the walker will fall to the bottom. In fact, it's not entirely clear how walkers moved in Star Wars. It can be assumed that the SPHA moved over rocky terrain, where the density and strength of the surface is much greater than that of soil or sand. In general, a super heavy artillery piece is an idea worthy of standing on the same shelf as Dora and other projects driven by Gigantomania and a lack of common sense. ATOT remains. In short, it is meaningless. It is not suitable for combat use due to the lack of a roof, and there is simply no need for a cargo walker. Wheeled trucks, actively used by all armies of the world, are much more efficient and faster. The role of transporting soldiers in difficult terrain can be performed by the ground ATTE, suitable for infantry fire support. Thus, the only walker capable of finding application in the real world is the ATTE, and then with the lion's share of modernization. With the further development of technologies in the field of robotics, including walking. The creation of an insectoid walking tank is becoming an easier task, which actualizes the need for such technology. However, these are only fantasies for the future. While for modern human civilization, the walker remains simply unnecessary due to the presence of other simpler types of equipment capable of performing similar tasks. Thus, although the ATTE is quite realistic from a design point of view, and the concept of its use would be very interesting, such a machine in modern realities does not justify the costs of its creation. But there is a high chance that in the future, we will be able to see various walking tanks and special vehicles including similar ATTE 